So this week and weeks five and six, I'm touching on some things that so there are some things, there are even things that some people even don't really like to speak on because they can be considered contentious. But as I said at the beginning, the theme of Holy Spirit is unity. And my hope is that these things that we look at bring us together, you know, rather than cause the divisions, obviously, because that's not the heart of Holy Spirit and the overall heart of God. Um, and um, so I wanted to, um, to mention that too. <clears throat> this is the theme verse for today, Luke 4.18. We're going to be coming back to that and looking at that in a little bit. And I'm going to choose one word out of that that I want to suggest to you is particularly important today. So, sorry, Madeline, but I'm going to pray as well. <clears throat> <laughs> this is from the Common Prayer for Ordinary Radicals, which if you haven't checked that out and you're into liturgy, then please check out this book because it is awesome. It's phenomenal. Let us pray. Lord God, help us to live out your gospel in the world. We pray for those who do not know your love that they would be wooed by your goodness and seduced by your beauty. Form us into a family that runs deeper than biology or nationality or ethnicity, a family that is born again in you. May we be creators of holy mischief and agitators of comfort. People who do not accept the world as it is, but insist on its becoming what you want it to be. Let us groan as in the pains of childbirth for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to be midwives of that kingdom. Amen. Isn't that great? So, last week we looked at Holy Spirit as comforter, as counselor, as the one who guides us into all truth as the one who reminds us. We had this big focus on the nature and character of God within the things that we were looking at. And we also looked at the fact that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness and returned in the power of the Spirit. And when that happened, it says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now, I want us to begin with to, us to realize just how important it is that he went to Galilee. You know, Gerard Kelly from the Bless Network describes Galilee as a gathering place for misfits and rejects, a safe place for those shunned by their own cultures. Jesus went to the vulnerable and the people that didn't feel they fitted first. And that says so much about the heart of God. And if we think about what that means for us, and I'm suggesting to you that that's not a coincidence. Um, what does that mean for us today? Well, I want to suggest to you what that means for us today is, our, is a call to the city. The United Nations estimates that by 2050, close to 75% of the world's population is going to be urban. Now, this is not to discount listening to God and being called to and the importance of rural communities. But reality is purely on a statistical level, when I, with working with young people, if God's calling someone to be a missionary, then on pure statistical reality, they're going to be called to the city. So what does that mean for how we plant churches? What does that mean for how we start ministries and how we actually reach out with God's love within urban settings? Jeremiah 29 verse 7 says, and work for the, priests, the, peace, the, the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Isn't that something? We're called to pray for Norwich. It actually says that our welfare is tied into how we pray for our city. Whoa. I was fortunate to be part of an urban ministry within YWAM for 13 years in North America, where I had the privilege of working with this amazing set of men and women, where we were working with people to help establish ministries in different cities across North America, primarily in the United States and Canada. And, and it was um, such a joy. 
So it's a big part of my heart. So switching gears a little bit. I want to ask you a question. I have to think for a second here. What does it mean to be a spirit-filled Christian? Just think about that for a moment. What does it mean to be a spirit-filled Christian? And you might have some different images of things come to your mind with that. And the chances are that an awful lot of what you're thinking is absolutely correct. Because it's one of those questions that I think has potentially different answers to it. But I do want to lean into one specifically that I don't hear being talked about very much. It goes back to our theme verse for today. Luke 4, 18. And the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And you've probably guessed by the subtle thing on my PowerPoint here. I want to suggest to you that the most important word in that actually is the word because. <laughs> you see, you know, so much of what we have heard in Christian culture over years is that we're filled with the spirit to be blessed. We're filled with the spirit to have the power of the spirit. We've been filled to have rivers of living water. We've been filled with the spirit to, to be blessed and then to be a blessing, to be fair as well. But Jesus comes along and he says he's already spent 40 days fasting in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. He comes out and one of the first things he says to a group of people in the community is the spirit of the Lord has anointed me because I have been called to preach good news to the poor. Now, when was the last time you heard the definition of a spirit filled Christian being somebody that, is, that preaches good news to the poor? And the, the thing about this is that what this tells us is that we're meant to be giving out. You see, there's been a lot of culture regarding Holy Spirit where Holy Spirit blesses and fills us. But the problem with that is, as you know, if you keep getting filled and keep getting filled and keep getting filled and you get plugged up, it's not very nice, is it? I call that in our Christian world, as you can see here, I call that constipated Christianity. God doesn't want us to be constipated Christians. He wants us to be filled up, to pour that out, and then go get filled again. In Ephesians, where it says be continually filled with the Spirit, it means being filled constantly because of us leaking it out, of pouring it out. So this is a call to both declare and demonstrate good news. Matthew implies the poor being poor in spirit. Luke implies the poor being the poor. You see, and if you look at the passage overall, basically what this passage is saying is that evangelism and social justice are meant to be spirit-filled and spirit-led activities. And they're also not to be completely unrelated to one another, which is a, a common battle in the church that I've tried to address for many, many years now. And as someone that's lived among the poor, worked with people, old people, children, victims of trafficking, refugees, immigrants, and vulnerable women, it's sad to me sometimes that this the way that Holy Spirit can be misunderstood can actually be have a negative effect where some of the difficulties that I've had in partnerships have been sometimes more with Christian groups sometimes than groups that aren't faith based in terms of how they function. I wish that wasn't true, but I found it to be true at times. Still without knowledge is foolishness. And I know that because I operated in that foolishness at times in my own life sure <laughs> through unbalanced zeal in my own <clears throat> in my own life i've found a way that i have 
demonstrated and declared faith to people has been for me most enjoyable when it's through an unassuming way in relationships with people in a way where it just comes out as a result of Jesus being such a part of my life where it comes out just in a natural normal sort of a way. I found this particularly true in relationship to the work with uh, I was doing in the States in ref with refugees and also um, with um, getting with being, getting to know people from different Muslim communities as well. And um, I shared an office with a, a dear man who's a, a Muslim from Somali who had been a refugee. And um, we went out together for Moroccan food. So an Englishman and a Somali go out to well, go out to a Moroccan restaurant. It almost sounds like a joke. And, um, and we sat down and we had an interfaith dialogue with each other in which there were things that I learned about Islam in terms of perceptions that I had had in terms of people talking about intimacy with God and the way that they talk about that. Some things in terms of how community is defined that I hadn't understood. And he learned things about Christianity that he hadn't learned either. And that turned into a great working partnership together where we worked together to help refugees over the next, um, that was for three years that we shared an office together. And it was a great experience. I've been asked some delightful questions during that time. And one of the questions, this is one of the best questions I've ever been asked in my life. And um, it's this. Tell me about the big red fat man. Father Christmas. I mean, in certain parts of the world, in terms of Santa Claus and Father Christmas, I mean, if you really think about it, if you kind of take yourself out of the culture that we're in and in America and other places, and you think about that from other cultures, it's a pretty weird thing. <laughs> Isn't it really? <laughs> and so that led into some conversations that were actually really, really fun and interesting about Christmas relating to Jesus and even talking about Jesus himself having been a refugee. I remember big time going over to a lady's house um, to take her and her daughter to a medical appointment. And there was a lady, um, the lady was there and she made me a cup of tea because she was running late. And I don't know if you're familiar with this program because it's from America, but a man called Jerry Springer who's not exactly it's not a very particularly great sort of chat show kind of a thing and she pointed at the television screen and said in english to me christian which led into this amazing conversation about how you know in christianity in the western world it's not the same as everything being defined as muslim within a country in terms of national identity and how you've got more aspects of personal faith for people within christianity and stuff like that so it was a natural conversation that led to a beautiful discussion about faith I've also been more of a traditional evangelist sometimes in my life. I preached in Mexico once on a street where I actually, with a team, where I actually had people, people throw rocks at me. Not the funniest thing. So evangelism for me is not something I've considered that I'm particularly gifted at, but sometimes it is. And I... Um, Sometimes I've been a reluctant evangelist, <laughs> just being honest. And I think that's something that I, I'm being challenged in, even at the moment, actually, of uh, something that Karen and I have talked about over, even over the last few months. So, and obviously, ministry like this means getting involved in people's lives. So I put down here, would you rather be in a smelly barn with Jesus or outside with the angels? Isn't that an interesting thought when it comes to going back to Christmas again? <laughs> it's an interesting thing, isn't it? So the gospel means good news. Someone once said that the gospel is inviting, a, is, is inviting a fisherman to become a shepherd. 
And there's been a lot of confusion. And I've gone through a journey myself, and a lot of people have gone through a journey, especially in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of questioning of what, what is actually is the gospel. Because just going up to somebody in traditional sort of evangelical style and saying three things to somebody and feeling like you've done your job and walking off and then the person doesn't receive Christ and it's their fault because they didn't hear what you said doesn't really cut it. Sometimes it does because of the goodness and the grace of God. But many times it doesn't because there's so much richness to the gospel. And when you think about what the disciples and what Paul understood the gospel to be when they talked about the gospel. You go back to Isaiah 52. With the Septuagint and the New Living Translation seems to be the closest to that. And it talks about good news of peace, salvation and the reign of God. And we've had this thing over the last, especially 15, 20 years. Of, well, the gospel is all about peace. It's all about shalom. It's all about wholeness and integration. Well, yes. <laughs> um, the gospel is all about salvation. It's getting people out of hell and getting them into heaven. It's all about eternal destiny. And also about our, just our closeness and intimacy with God. Well, you've got that as well. It's all about the kingdom. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. So it's all about the kingdom and the rule and reign of God and what that means. Well, the good news about the good news is all, is it's all three of them. <laughs> You know, and I encourage you, uh, YWAM, as I encourage you all the time, you listen to God about what you do in actually talking about the gospel with another person, because Jesus didn't pretty much do the same thing with anybody when he talked to anyone. He was listening to the father. So his conversation with the rich young ruler, his conversation with Zacchaeus, his uh, conversation with Nicodemus his conversation with the woman at the well, you couldn't get more different things that Jesus talked about with those people. And yet Jesus is the good news and was being good news to those people. So it's not about a message that's a spiel. It's a message of what's in our heart and what we are listening to the Holy Spirit for in terms of what we share and communicate with others. A psychologist once described it as the agape of the unconditional love, the metanoia of the change of the mind, the therapia of the healing of the heart and the basileia of the kingdom. You see, and this word good news here is the word evangelizo, which is where we get evangelism from in the Septuagint. That word is used 21 times by Paul and 19 times in the book of Acts. So you really got a bottom line of the, when the disciples and Paul and, and others at that time were talking about the gospel, there seems to be this understanding that this is mostly what they were talking about. And it's kind of interesting as well that Paul says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy, guess what, in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> now, moving along, one of the things with evangelism, I'm particularly, and sharing and declaring faith that I think is really cool is I feel that I'm very passionate about church planting. You know, my wife and I planted a church and pastored a church for a number of years, and we've been involved in church plants over and over again throughout our life and ministry together and in acts 9 31 i don't know if you've ever noticed this but i just think this is brilliant then the churches throughout all judea and galilee and samaria had peace and were edified as a good christian use word and walking in the fear of the lord and guess look at this and in the comfort of the holy spirit they multiplied I mean, I studied church growth and nobody ever read me that verse. Hmm. 
you know, we've got all this stuff about techniques and, you know, multiplying and how you set your chairs up and how you do this and how you do that. And yet the word of God tells us the church is multiplied by the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Wow. That's something to think about, isn't it? So I want to encourage you that you have been anointed to preach good news to the poor. You have been empowered as a Christian. You have been empowered to be, to both declare and demonstrate faith to the poor and the vulnerable. And it's part of our call of Christians to engage in that in some kind of a way. And of course, I'm saying this to St. Stephen's. You guys know that. Those of you from St. Luke's, you know that. <laughs> But it's an encouragement to know that it's not just a calling of something we're meant to do. You have been empowered to do it. That's the beauty of this thing. The spirit is upon you because he's anointed you to preach good news. Now, the second thing is healing. Oh, boy, I'm really going to hit the time with this one. Sorry, I've got to... Um, So we've been empowered to share and declare faith and demonstrate faith. Jesus also said, Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I'm going to talk a little bit about healing and demons for a moment. Things that people usually don't like to talk about. But if we're going to talk about Holy Spirit, we have to talk about these things because it tells us here that even Jesus was anointed with Holy Spirit and with power. Notice those two things are written separately, as I mentioned last week, in terms of healing the sick. Now, we can do a whole separate thing on this another time and go in huge depth. And if you want minute prayer ministry training, training in a manual prayer and things like that, would love to connect on that in a much more detailed way in another time so i'm keeping this very straightforward here just for a moment but in matthew 10 we see that the, jesus called the 12 disciples and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness so there's some there's empowerment here in this in these areas that i just want us to quickly recognize and in acts 28 i just got can't not say this because this is such a passion of mine and it's so important this story is just fabulous and it's really very freeing for a lot of people in acts 28 paul goes to the island of uh, malta and there's this man and his father is very sick and long story short paul prays over him and it says that he gets healed and then it says after that that they then went around the island and people were cured. Good thing is they got better. <laughs> That's the important thing. But here's the interesting thing. The word healed, where Paul talks about being healed, means healed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word cured is actually means healed by medical means. So here we have the first medical missions here in the book of Acts. That was Dr. Luke doing his thing. So you have this beautiful combination. So when people try and tell you that, you know, oh, I'm trusting God and I'm not going to doctors and things like that. Both of these things are in scripture and God used, even in the word of God, both aspects of these things to bring healing to people. So I know sometimes people have come from backgrounds where, you know, you, you, there's just faith and you know what I'm saying? So. I just I like to say that because I've worked with people sometimes that have come from those backgrounds and found that understanding particularly helpful. <clears throat> so. And again, I, I'm not going to go into reasons why people don't get healed. Obviously, there are reasons. And there's also one of the re one of the reasons is for me is I don't know. <laughs> within suggesting some of the things as the reason why. So I'm not going to go into that again. But again, I've seen too much to deny the reality. 
I remember one time I was um, when I was pastoring down in Cornwall, um, I got invited to a church and I went there. And on the way there, I felt the Lord speak to my heart and say, I want you to pray over someone's left elbow. So I went in and I started um, speaking and I said, I feel like I'm meant to pray for someone's left elbow. And this lady actually shouted out. Um, she said, oh, my goodness, I've been healed. And then she stopped for a couple of seconds and then she said, and this is hilarious, she said, my husband's going to kill me. And so I stopped what I was doing and I went over to her and I said, you've got to tell us what's going on here. She said, well, I've had this problem with this elbow for years and years and years. And just two weeks ago, my husband bought me a brand new car with this really fancy power steering so I could drive it comfortably with my bad elbow. And it's just right as rain right now. And I could know that God's just healed this elbow. Isn't that hilarious? I wish we had time for more stories, but... The important thing in these things is that the priority is the person getting better. The priority is love and the priority is care, you know, and we give dignity to every person as someone that's been made in the image of God when it comes to praying for anybody that um, we're praying for healing for in any kind of a way. So <clears throat> I just want to say this, like prophecy, this has always sometimes been done, sadly, in a way that has been abusive and caused much hurt. Many people won't even talk or teach about these things. Karen and I have listened to many sad stories of deep wounds. It can sometimes be rooted in someone praying for others that cares more about the story of healing someone than the person actually getting better. Our most important role in these things is simply to love and to care. So I wanted to make that statement to go along with the other things that I've said. Thank you. C.S. Lewis in the Screw Tape Letters said this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. When it comes to talking about demons in the spiritual realm, I always suggest that the important thing is that we're willing to have it on our radar. Having traveled around different parts of the world and seen what I've seen, again, it's very, very difficult to deny the reality of there being a world that is not the one that we're a part of, so to speak and the reality of demonic activity. And we see that even in the book of Acts where crowd, crowds gathered and it says that those who were tormented by impure spirits who came and were healed. So this seems to be with what Jesus did, what Jesus said and what the early church did and said to be part of the package. And that's why I bring it up because we see here in the scriptures that the, the Holy Spirit empowered us to share, to dem demonstrate and declare faith. That Holy Spirit empowers us for the healing of the sick and empowers us for people to be free from demonic activity and aspects of darkness. Um, and again, just... I'll never forget this because it was just so crazy. I was playing a gig in a band in British Columbia in Canada and we finished the gig and it was like a, a worship band outdoor gathering um, and it had gone really, really well. And we packed up our gear and I was sitting by a wall at the side of where we'd done this concert. <laughs> and, um, and I'm actually, and I'm dangling my feet. It's, um, there's some leaves on the ground and uh, quite a few leaves. And all of a sudden, this man pops his head up from under these leaves, this homeless guy. I, did, I, I hadn't seen him. I hadn't spotted him because he was mostly under the leaves. Scared me like, anyway, you get the idea. Um, so he just looks at me and he says, hi. So I'm like, hi, how are you? The typical kind of questions, you know. And he immediately starts going on about this gambling addiction problem that he has and this relationship issue that he has. And in the middle of this conversation, he stops, he looks at me, 
and his eyes turn into an orangey color. He looks me in the face and says, this is Lucifer's territory. And I like to say that I had a decent quiet time that morning. <laughs> and um, I just looked back at the guy and I said, well, it may have been Lucifer's territory, but we've just finished having an amazing worship time here and it's not anymore. So you've got to go. And the guy just jumped up to his feet and then just ran off. And that was it. That was the end of the story. But I've seen, you know, I was speaking at a conference in Newcastle when a man just fell on the floor just screaming right in front of me and we took him around to a back room and spent an hour and a half praying and he came into an amazing place of freedom just from being prayed for. I was speaking at a Bible school once where it, the culture there was to believe that the devil was deaf and the more you shouted, the more it would change the person's life and it was deeply sad and disturbing and didn't help the person at all. We had somebody who was on staff working with us in Canada when we were there, who was working with a young person who had been imprisoned for a very serious crime. And she came from a culture of a church like that. And she came to us and said, um, I feel like this person's got some demonic problems, but I don't feel I can really pray for them because obviously it's kind of quiet. So Karen and I said, well, why, why do you have to be loud? Why can't you just quietly pray over the person and with the authority of Jesus? And, you know, and she did. And it, um, the person actually admitted that they had some issues that they realized that they had and that she saw that person change in front of her face. That's the biggest thing I've seen is changes in people's faces when I've prayed in this area. And again, as C.S. Lewis said, this isn't something to be infatuated with, but it is, and it's not something where we either have too much attention to it or no attention at all. It's something where we have these things on our radar as a willingness to listen to God for there being something that we're willing to listen to God to help and do something about. You see, and I want to suggest to you that when it comes to how people are freed from this kind of thing, Sometimes it's through a longer term work of therapy and soul work and spiritual integration, which has become a major thing in terms of what Karen and I find ourselves doing nowadays. Sometimes it's through direct prayer. Sometimes it's through serving the vulnerable. I love it in Isaiah 58 where it says, talks about serving the vulnerable in various ways and then says, if you do these things, your healing shall spring forth speedily. When I teach this course over a whole week, I tend to, I, I actually sing songs that I've written and different things as a part of it. And a song that I wrote a couple of years ago is called Better to Light a Candle. And I'm just going to tell you the lyrics because I'm not going to, I'm already way over the time that I should be. So I'm already in the naughty corner. But, um, but I'm just going to tell you the lyrics because if I sing it, it's going to be too long and it will take too much time. I would have liked to have done, but, but, um, but it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Better the friend you find than the enemy you blame. Better to fight oppression than to make fear your obsession. God of love, be at home in me. You show your love to all who cry to you, a love that is strong and true. Better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Better to not hold in, but to openly confess. Better to serve the poor than the temptations at your door. God of love, be at home in me. You show your love to all who cry to you, a love that is strong and true. I'll not be defined by failure or success. Better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So I think that sums up kind of a lot of where I've been theologically with this kind of stuff, you know, in some ways. We can be freed from some of these things purely through conversion. You know, I've done some things as a musician on in bands. So I don't really need to elaborate on that very much, you know, that kind of lifestyle. 
where I was freed from some amazing things just in my personal conversion experience in a hotel room in Canada <laughs> in 1983. Um, worship. Um, James says that we're to go to the elders sometimes to ask for healing and things in the church. We had this amazing woman who came to us. Well, I was an elder in a church in, in the US where um, this, this lady came to us and said, I'm coming to the elders because I read in the Bible that you do that because I feel like there's something inside of me where something's not kind of right. And um, so we gathered as elders in someone's house with her and with other people around to make it a, a safe place. And, and she knew us all well. And I felt the Lord speak to my heart to go grab a guitar. Thankfully, they had one. I didn't even know they and, uh, and we started doing worship songs. Again, as we worshipped, this lady's face kind of became contorted or somewhat. But then afterwards, it then changed into there was just this light and these eyes of joy and the eyes of the presence of Jesus. And it was just beautiful and wonderful. And worship can often be a very powerful thing in terms of seeing people freed from these kinds of things. And then there's lifestyle choices that can relate to sex, money, and power. We think of these kinds of, when we talk about demonic type things, we have a fairly stereotypical view of what that can look like. But what if somebody is having problems of issues in their life because of business practices that are unhealthy and negative affecting the lives of others? What if it's to do with aspects of sexual activity or how money is being used? Uh, you know, these things, sex, money and power can have a lot of things to do with some of these kinds of things because it can be about systems as well as about individuals. And I'll actually touch on that more next week. So I wanna encourage you, we see from Matthew 10 and we see through the, especially in the first five or six chapters of the book of Acts, that we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to both be good news and share good news, to heal the sick and to see people freed from things in their lives, including demonic things that, uh, that can get in the way. And I'm not saying that that works out the way that it should all the time. And I don't completely understand that, as I've said, and, uh, we won't, and I haven't got time to go on that, but I wanna encourage you today that God has empowered us in these areas. And the more we step out in faith and try these things as well, the more we're gonna see good things happen with it, okay? So I'm gonna close in prayer with this. This is the prayer of Caterman which is a beautiful explanation of the gospel. And uh, so I'm just going to close out with this prayer. So we're not going to have as much time to chat today, but I think it's good that we kind of touched on these areas. So just um, either look at these words, listen to these words as I, <clears throat> as I read this. I cannot speak unless you loose my tongue. I only stammer. And I speak uncertainty. Sorry, I speak uncertainly. But if you touch my mouth, my Lord, then I will sing the story of your wonders. Teach me to hear that story through each person, to cradle a sense of wonder in their life, to honor the hard-earned wisdom of their sufferings, to waken their joy that the King of all kings stoops down to wash their feet and looking up into their faces says, I know, I understand. This world has become a world of broken dreams where dreamers are hard to find. And friends are few. Lord, be the gatherer of our dreams. You set the countless stars in place and found room for each of them to shine. You listen for us in your heaven bright hall. Open our mouths to tell our tales of your wonder. Teach us again the greatest story ever. The one who made the worlds became a helpless child, then grew to be a carpenter with deep, far-seeing eyes. In time, the carpenter began to travel in every village, challenging the people to leave behind their selfish ways, be washed in living water and let God be their king. The ordinary people crowded round him, frightened to miss a word that he was speaking, bringing their friends, their children, all the sick and tired so everyone could meet him. Everyone could be touched and given life. Some religious people were embarrassed. They did not like the company he kept and never knew just what he would do next. 
He said, how dare you wrap up in God in good behavior and tell the poor that they should be like you? How can you live at ease with riches and success while those that I love go hungry and are oppressed? Is it really for such a time as this that I was given breath? His words were dangerous, not tidy or safe. In secret, his opponent said it would surely be better that one person die. I think that would be better if he could. Expediency would be the very death of him. He died because they thought it might be good. You died that we might be forgiven, Lord, but that was not the end. You plundered death and made its jailhouse shudder, strode into life to meet your friends. I have a dream that all the world will meet you and know you, Jesus, in your living power, that someday soon all people everywhere will hear your story and hear it in a way they understand. I cannot speak unless you loose my tongue. I only stammer. And I will speak uncertainly, but if you touch my mouth, my Lord, then I will sing the story of your wonders. So many who have heard forget to tell the story. Here I am, Jesus. Teach me. Amen.